sleeping because you're still eating turkey and still eating mashed potatoes and still eating sweet potato cast. How many of you had like three meals of that? I just, I'm ready to throw it away because it, it stays there. I just keep eating it and I just, it's not healthy for anybody. Today we're starting a new sermon series. We're going to talk over the next four weeks about some commands of God. And, and these commands of God, they, they're here to, to help, uh, to help round off some edges, maybe. These commands of God are, are sort of like, they're sort of like these chisels, right? So um, for about a year now, on Fridays, I go over to a friend of mine, John Joe Evans. He owns a woodworking shop over in Winston, and I go over there, and um, he's teaching me how to refinish furniture and different things, and I've noticed since I've been over there, like, when you're in there and you're working in the wood shop, we rarely use chisels. Normally, we're just refinishing, we're sanding, we're doing whatever, but chisels are for shaping. They're just for like taking off some edges, and you'll use a chisel just a little bit, and then you'll step back and you'll look at it, and you'll use a different one maybe, and you'll step back and you'll look at it until it gets exactly how you want it to be. These commands of God that we're going to talk about over the next four weeks are sort of like these chisels. They, they don't cut off huge edges. They don't just break things in half. They're not made to destroy. They're made to shape us into the people God wants us to be. So as we get into this, we're going to look at this this week, and, and we're going to be in uh, John where, where Jesus uh, asked Peter to feed his sheep, and we'll get into that in just a second. But as we get into this, I want to make sure we're all in the same place. I think uh, God gives us commands for a reason, but why does he give us commands? Because he, he doesn't command us to do everything. Sometimes we just get some stories. Sometimes we live by the example of what Jesus had. But there are specific commands that Jesus gives us, so why are those more important than others, and, and who are they really important to? So I'd like to set up this frame, like we're going to be working this frame. These commands of God, we've got to understand, are given to us by our Father. As we're listening to these commands over the next four weeks, I want us to think about it in the context of our family. God is not here to just have like the sledgehammer. He's trying to beat us down. He, he's not here to make you feel horrible. He's not here to just ruin your life. He's not here to do any of the above. He's here to try making sure that you have life abundantly. And sometimes to do that, we got to get rid of some edges. We got to get rid of some things that, that we like to hold on to. So, so the first step in understanding God's commands is, is to live as if God was the creator of the universe, that God actually created everything, that he, that he, spoke, it into, he spoke it into being, like God is the creator of all things. God knows you and I better than we know ourselves. We have to come into this framework with God knows me better than I know me. He knows what I need. He knows what I do not need, even though I want that sometimes. We have to understand that as we move along here. We need to know that um, God made the most serious sacrifice a father could make. And God is a loving father. That is the framework that we're going to try using when we understand these commands of God. So when you go into these commands and you're like, I don't like that. It doesn't feel right. I think that's wrong. I think he, he, Scott's just talking to me today. Somebody must have told him, my husband, my wife, my boyfriend, girlfriend, parents, whoever it is. They called him and told him to say that. They didn't. But if you're feeling like that, it's because God is trying to take off an edge today, and, and sometimes that, that's uh, a little more painful than we would like it to be. So the other thing I want to I point out here, if you are here today and you are not a follower of Jesus, do these commands apply to you? The answer is no. If you, do, if you are not a follower of Jesus, the commands of the Father they aren't for you. Now, if you want to start following Jesus, for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, they apply to every one of us. Whether we like them or not, they apply to every one of us. But sometimes I think we as Christians really mess things up as we get into this. We try holding non-Christians to the same standards that we hold Christians to. And God never meant it to be that way. Inside the family, we've got certain rules, right? At your house, You've got certain rules where people sit and, and, and how punishment is handed out or whatever it might be, and that's how it happens at your house. That does not mean that it happens at the neighbor's house like that. 
And God has set these things up like that. So if today you, fo- you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then for the next four weeks, these commands are for you. Period. If you are here today and you are not a follower of Jesus, you get to look into and get to see what God sort of expects from his followers. And we're going to talk about why he expects them and, and, and how to handle that over the next few weeks. So what happens if I don't like the commands of God? You probably won't like the commands of God. Let's just put that there. That's probably why they're commands. As I started looking at these different things, God gives these commands sometimes because he knows that we need them. And we probably won't do them on our own. But they're healthy for us. So when you run into one of these commands, whether it's this week or over the next few weeks, and you say, I don't know that I like that. That's fine. You don't have to like it. You just have to work, work towards it. You still got to do it, right? Um, so what happens if I disagree with the commands of God? You could very well disagree with the commands of God. Our culture is set up to be completely opposite of what Scripture says these days. So you will run into one of these over the next four weeks that you disagree with. But here's the deal, right? We go back to the framework of family. I know what, what happened in my house when, you know, my mom said, okay, it's time to clean the room, or you have to do your dishes, or like in my house right now, I tell Bella and Peyton to stop yelling at your sister. It doesn't really work. I say it. It doesn't work. They, you know, they get punished, whatever. But whatever it is, when we give a command, when I give a command to my children, when a command was given to me as a child, I could choose whether to do it or not. And I I, I, like, here's how I tell kids in the youth group. If, you're, if your kids are in the youth group with me, they, they might have heard this before. Uh, if not, they'll hear it here soon. We can do this the easy way or the hard way, but it's getting done, right? And this is how God looks at us. I've given you these commands. You can choose not to like it. I don't care. You can choose try not to do it. I don't care. It's going to get done. Now, either you can listen the first time and it's less painful or you cannot listen all these times, and it becomes more and more painful. And some of you have experienced that in your life when God asks you to do something, and you don't, and all these extra little things and issues start popping up into your life. So what happens if I choose not to live out these commands? It's really simple. If you run into one of these commands, if any of Scripture you run into any of these commands, and you choose not to follow out these commands, you're not following Jesus. Therefore, you're not a follower of Jesus. So you might have thought that you were because you attended church, because you are trying to stop cussing, because you have one of those Christian T-shirts. I, I, I don't know what, like, why people think they're Christians these days. Um, that might be your deal. But if you run into a command of God and you choose, no, I'm not doing that, period, you're not following God. Therefore, he is not your father. We will not hold you to the same command. So, so that's a test you can sort of give to yourself. I'm not here, it's not my job to judge you. Um, that's between you and that's between God. So you'll figure that out. So, so why does God give us commands? And I think God gives us a commands for a few reasons. To show us what he really cares about, first of all. He, he shows us what he really cares about. When he commands us to do something, he knows because it is so important that he wants to make sure that we don't miss it. He gives us some commands to help us learn about what actions need to be taken to have a better relationship with him and to have a better relationship with each other. Because God is all about relationships. You look at the Ten Commandments, all of those are about having a better relationship with God or having a better relationship with each other. Every single one of them, period. That's why God gives us commands, because he wants us to have a good relationship with him and a good relationship with other people. And if you're struggling to do that, go back and look at his commands, and I bet you're messing one of those up. You get that right, and everything else will start falling into place. I think God also gives us commands because if we had a choice for a lot of these, we wouldn't do them. I know I wouldn't. I've run into some of these commands, and I'm like, I don't like that. And God's like, I don't care. You know, you you still got to do it. You still got to move forward with it. So I want to give you a, a, a tool today. Write this down. This is like your seminary word for the day. People are like, Oh, did you go to church? Yeah, I went to church. What did you learn at church today? I learned the word hermeneutics. 
Oh, hermeneutics. You will never hear it anywhere except for like in Bible college or seminary or wherever it is. We won't use it around here probably again. It is basically how you study your Bible. And it has tools set up. It has rules set up on if you're going to read your Bible, you're going to study your Bible, there's a few things you have to put in line first. And the first thing you need to know is context is king. Context is king. If you're pulling a scripture right out of the context and you're applying it to your life, you're probably missing a lot of what was going on around there. I tell people when you're reading it and, and, and you look up in the back of your Bible, right? We, we'll, we'll look up in the back of our Bible or we'll find something on the Internet about love or hate or money or, or whatever it might be. And then we'll go to there and we'll read it and we'll be like, yes, this says you know, this and I love it. Read the chapter before it and read the chapter after it and see if it still sort of says what you think it was trying to say. So context is king. The second thing we need to remember is Scripture interprets Scripture. So when you find Scripture one place that says something, see if there's another place in the Bible that maybe it says the same thing, it uses the same word, it uses the same phrasing, whatever it might be, and then you will understand it quite a bit better. So we need to recognize that context is king and Scripture interprets Scripture. And now we're going to sort of get into this here. We're going to be in John chapter 21, verse 17. If you guys have got your Bibles, um, you can go ahead and open those up. But I want to give you some context. So as we jump into Scripture here, you've got to understand what's happened. This is John chapter 21. There were 20 chapters before this. We can't just open this up and figure out what's going on here. So in John chapter 21, here's what sort of happened before. Um, Jesus ha has had his last supper. Um, did, did any of you have... Um, was it velvet, maybe? I don't know. Like, my grandparents had hanging on the wall in our basement. It was one of those, I think it was a rug. So it was hung on the wall for some reason. And it was, it was the Last Supper. And it, was, it was sort of like velvet, but we weren't really allowed to touch it because it was, like, holy. Um, I, ugly. But, man, like, my, anybody else have that in there? There's, like, two of us. The rest of you don't know anything about this. You need to go find one because you don't love Jesus if you haven't seen one. I mean, it's... It's sort of like, oh, I don't even know what to do with that. I mean, it's come over to the office. We have one on the wall that the last church left for us. Um, I can let you borrow it if you would like to take it to your home. Um, you can have it with you. But remember, Jesus sits down for the, for the last supper. So he sits down with the last meal, and he says, okay, one of you here will betray me. And we know he's talking about Judas, but actually two people betray him there. It's Judas and it's, it's Peter. And then Jesus said... Hey, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And J Peter was having none of it. Peter was like, you better watch your mouth, boy. Like, that's my interpretation. I don't, like, the ESV and NIV don't say that. But Peter was upset when Jesus said, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And he's like, no, no. I don't know if you know who I am. Like, I keep it real. You know, th I, that's in my mind. That's what Peter is doing. Like, he's like, I'm going all the, I'll go to death with you. And Jesus is like, oh, you're going to give it a shot, boy, but you're going to, you're going to come up short. So there's, there's my version. I don't know. Y'all don't get that very much. We're going to have to work on our communication skills. So, so Peter did. He denied Jesus three times. And Jesus dies on the cross. And he returns a few times to, to his apostles and to different people. And the apostles didn't know who he was. So, so the apostles, uh, Jesus goes away and they, they return back to, to what they know best. And we got a, bus, a bunch of custom fishermen here. In my mind, they're still... You know, you cuss like sailors. Well, a lot of his guys were fishermen, so in my mind, they were still working on their language a little bit, you know? But they're like, okay, Jesus is gone. What do we do now? Uh, how about we go fishing? Because they were all professional fishermen. So they go out, and they decide to go fishing, and they're out there fishing, and they get absolutely nothing. And they start heading back in, and they see this guy on the beach around a campfire cooking up some fish. And one of the guys says, that's Jesus. And now my man, Peter, like, he, if any of you are out there, if you are a ready, fire, aim type person, you are just like Peter. Me and Peter, we can hang out. 
So somebody's like, oh, that's Jesus. And he takes off his outer cloak and he dives in the water and begins swimming. And like I've said this before here, like in my mind, they pass Peter because they're in a boat and they go faster than somebody who's swimming. But, but they, they end up getting to the beach and they get to the beach and they realize that it's Jesus there. And they have this meal with Jesus. And as they're having this meal with Jesus, after he has gone, he has died on the cross, he showed back up. They're sitting there and they're having this meal in John chapter 21 verses 15 through 17. And it says this. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? This is something I just noticed this morning as I was going back over scripture again. He does this in front of the group. Do you love me more than these other knuckleheads? Because before, Peter was like, I love you better than everybody. Don't nobody love you, Jesus, like I love you. And now he's asking him again, do you love me more than the rest of these? Now, here's something else. That if you grew up in church, you, you have probably heard this before. I know most people here did not grow up in church. So there are different words for love here, right? They say you can tell what is important to a people by the many words that they have for uh, whatever they're trying to say. So there are, there are three, three, four Greek words for love. And Jesus and Peter here are using different words for love at the beginning. So I want to go back here and I want to read this. In in verse 15 it says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Agape is this sacrificial, it is this deep, abiding love. This is the love that God has for his people, that that he would sacrifice his son on the cross. This is a love that, that parents have for their children, um, th- this is the type of love that he says. He says, do you agape me more than these? And Peter replies, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I phileo you. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's where they get it from, the Greek word phileo, which means like friendship. Jesus said, do you love me sacrificially? And Peter's like, you know I love you like a friend? Uh, swing and a miss, right? Like, so, so he's not getting this. And Jesus says to Peter anyways, feed my lambs. And we go on in verse 16. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you agape? Do you sacrificially love me? And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a friend. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Verse 17, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you uh, love me like a friend? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you like a friend. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. So there are quite a few things going on here. Like we could could study this for, for quite a while. Uh, but we got 19 minutes left before you guys start throwing tomatoes and stuff at me. So I'm going to try getting through this, right? So one of the things that I, I love, I, I love about this is that Jesus wants you right where you are. He kept asking Peter, Peter, do you love me sacrificially? Do you love me with a deep love? And he's like, man, I love you like a friend. Like, we're boys. We can hang out. And he's like, eh, that's sort of not what I ask. But the third time, Jesus starts where Peter is. He says, Peter, do you love me like a friend? He's like, man, I'm sort of hurt that you would ask me a third time, but Lord, you know everything. You know I love you like a friend. Jesus started right where Peter was. I love that. And, and, and today, wherever you are, for some of you like, you know, you got Bible degrees or, or you've lived all of your life following Jesus and never messed anything up. You're probably not here at this church. You, you might be at a different one, but you're, you're probably not here. Um, or you can get up and leave now uh, if you are here because um, you realize you don't belong. But anyways, but he started right where Peter was. So any of you got like backgrounds you're not happy with? You think, oh, I'm not good enough. I don't know if I can figure this out. Jesus is like, I'm right where you are, man. We're going to be okay. Notice here that Jesus changes his understanding to align his love with that love that Peter has. And and here is something he does. He changes his commands. In verse 15, he says, feed my lambs. In verse 16, he says, take care of my sheep. And and, and then 
in verse uh, 17, he says, feed my sheep. So he changes the commands that he gives to Peter. He tweaks them just a little bit. So let me give you a little more context here about shepherds. He's asking him to take care of his sheep. He's essentially asking him to be a shepherd. And um, shepherds in this time, uh, sheep are a, are a type of animal that you can't put in fences. You've got to let them out. You've got to let them graze. They're, they're sort of dumb as a box of rocks from what I understand. Uh, I'm reading books on them. I don't know much about them. Um, but I think it was about four years ago, and I think we've got some pictures here. Um, about four years ago, I went to Kenya. And um, as, as we were going into Kenya, and let me also say this, uh, here at Catalyst, um, this is one of the missions that we support. Um, uh, we give about $1,200 a year uh, to this mission here in Kenya. So as we were coming into Kenya, I, I flew in, and we had a six-hour drive to Kenya. And as we were driving in, um, you can just keep flipping these pictures and choosing which one you like, Jen. As we're driving in, there, there are two kids on the side of the road. One of them's probably like 10, the other one's six. And, um, um, and as we're driving in, uh, there, there are these shepherds, probably 10 and 6 with, I don't know, probably 10 to 12 sheep, something like that. And, and we're driving in, and I'm like, what are these two kids just out here running around by the road by themselves? And, and, uh, and the, the guy from Kenya says, oh, they're taking care of their family's flock. I'm like, what? What do you mean taking care of their family's flock? They're like... I wouldn't let him out front of like, you know, you got you can come in when the street lights come on. Like he's 10 years old. Like he ain't allowed to be running around. But but he was a low man on the totem pole, and that's who shepherds are in your family. It's a dirty job. You're outside with your sheep all the time. But because of that, they learn to they learn to hear your voice, they learn to trust your voice. Uh, Often, these guys in Kenya or in Israel or wherever it is will come together, and two shepherds will come together, and their flocks will come together and intermingle, and you'll have a shepherd, you know, tell the flock to come to him, and only his sheep come. And he goes off with them, and then the other shepherd goes off with them, because the sheep know his voice so well, because they spend so much time together, that over and over again, th this here is like, this is they're drying their dishes out in the dirt, uh, right around all the chickens and the livestock running around. It seemed really odd to me, but... That's how they do things, so that's how we did things when they were there. All the dishes were always clean. Like those of you who are a little OCD, like you, you need to get a different glass every time you drink out of something, or did you clean that fork before you used it again? Normally this is the women. Like if it was up to me, I would have one fork, one spoon, and one knife in my house, probably one cup also. I'm the only one using it. I'll use it for like a week before I wash it. Like, like the, the food accumulates on there, and it tastes better, right? That, that's, how, that's how things are supposed to be. But Holly's, every time I turn around, I'm like, where's that fork that was over here? Holly's like, I washed it. Put it away. Like, why would you do that? It's my fork. It's been sitting out for days. I, I think she does this because she loves me. I don't know. But whatever. But uh, if you're that type of person, don't go over here to Kenya. Uh, because they want, I've got pictures. I don't know where they are of the water that they wash these clean dishes with. <laughs> you ain't seeing through it. Uh, but they know they're supposed to wash them, so they washed them. It was really odd. But anyways, so these kids are over there, and they're taking care of these sheep. And, and as Jesus is sitting here, and he's talking to Peter, and he's telling them, I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to take care of my sheep. He's saying, I want you to spend time with my people to where they know your voice. I want you to spend time with them in the good times and in the bad times. I want you to care for them all the time. And Peter understood this immediately because of their context. He knew what a shepherd's job was. Now, Peter was a fisherman, we know, but there was somebody in his family who was in charge of the flock. And he knew what their job was. It was to stay out there with these dumb animals and lead them from place to place so they could, they could find their own food. Well, they couldn't find their own food, but to make sure that they had something to eat. So this is what Jesus is telling to Peter here. He's saying, I want, you, I want you to protect them. I want you to serve them. I want you to feed them. This is the command. He says, feed my sheep. Now, now I want to go back here for a second um, because, remember, um, we have context as king, and then we have let Scripture uh, interpret Scripture. 
This is one of those things that Jesus does here that, that all the rabbis did at this point is they told a story and they threw in a scripture from the Old Testament that all of the Jewish people that they're talking to at this point, they recognize the scripture as soon as it comes up. We don't know our Old Testament like they did. We didn't have it memorized like they did. But when, when Jesus starts telling them this story, they immediately go to Ezekiel chapter 34. And they understand that Jesus is, is referencing what happened with Ezekiel chapter 34. Now, remember, as we're talking here, both in Peter's context and in the context of, of Ezekiel here, all the people around him are Jewish. Every single person. So, so we've got to keep that in mind, that this is a Jewish mindset and a Jewish context, and, and they understand the scriptures from a Jewish mindset. We don't. We don't. So we have to understand that going into this. In Ezekiel, if, if you've got your Bibles, you can look it up or, or, or uh, you can go to the front of your Bibles and check it out. But in, in Ezekiel chapter 34, it says this, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Now, that should sound familiar to you if you've read the New Testament much because Jesus references himself and he says, The son of man did this or the son of man did that. He takes that from Ezekiel. And everybody recognized it every time he did that. We see Son of Man referenced in the New Testament, and we don't have any idea where it's from. It's from Ezekiel chapter 34. So, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of Man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of of the flock? You eat the curds, you close yourselves with the wool, and you slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. In Ezekiel chapter 34, God is upset with not all of the shepherds, but the bad shepherds. The shepherds who got into it to make themselves out better. The shepherds who got into it so that, so that they could have the, the best of the food and the best of the clothes, and they didn't really care about the sheep. And Peter gets this reference. So when he tells Peter to take care of my flock, he's saying, remember back in Ezekiel when I was so upset with those shepherds because they weren't taking care of my people? Don't be one of them. Don't, don't be one of those people who are getting into it so that you can have more money, so that you can have more food, so that you can have more clothes, and you don't even care about my flock. Don't be one of those people. And Peter got that immediately. I missed it every time that I read it because I didn't know it went back to Ezekiel here. What Peter did is when Peter denied Jesus three times, he was that bad shepherd. Why did Peter deny Jesus three times? He was more worried about his own skin than he was about the relationship that he had with Jesus. I'm guessing he's not the only one who has done that from time to time. But Jesus reinstates him here. He goes on in, here in Ezekiel, and, and he, in, in verse 4 it says, you, um, you have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for the wild animals. My sheep wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill, and they were scattered all over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. He's saying to Peter, here's your job title. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be real prestigious. It's not going to be fun. But when I tell you I want you to take care of my lambs, do it right. And Peter knew that he was referencing Ezekiel 34, and right here, God gives him the problems that those shepherds were not doing is they were not strengthening the weak or healing the sick or taking care of the injured or looking for the lost sheep. They didn't do any of that. So what Jesus is implying and what Peter knows because he knows the scripture is he's telling me I need to take care of the weak, I need to heal the sick, 
I need to take care of the injured, and I need to look for the lost. That simple. When he said, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs, that's what he's saying, and Peter gets it completely. Verse 7, Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd, and so has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared about themselves rather than for my flock, Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds, and I will hold them accountable for my flock. Jesus is telling Peter, I knew you would not be a good shepherd before. Remember when I told you you're going to betray me three times, and you like took out your outer cloak, and you started squaring up, and you were ready to go at it with me? You weren't ready. It was all about yourself. Everybody knew that you were one of my three boys that, that we hung out and we were closest with. And you, you cared more about that than you cared about the people. And I knew you weren't ready. And we know that because you denied me three times. Re remember that, Peter? Now remember, this whole thing is going on with all the rest of the apostles there. He's not doing this behind closed doors. He's doing this in front of everybody. And everybody gets this reference here. He said, that is why you could not be a shepherd at that point because you would have been a bad shepherd because you were not following me. Now, this is Peter. This is the one who gives the, the first call in Acts. This is the one who becomes the leader of the church. This is the one who comes all the above. But this dude is a loser in every aspect if we're trying to mention this. I mean, Jesus called him Satan. He betrayed Jesus three times in front of this crowd. And here we are. Jesus is sitting down in front of a group with him. And Jesus was using this reference from the Old Testament to help move Peter forward. You see, there are good shepherds and there are bad shepherds. But God wanted to make sure that Peter, whoever he was using, and he knew he was going to choose Peter, that he was going to be a good shepherd. But to do that, I had to take off some edges, right? I had to take off some edges when, when he said, you know, I, I'm going to leave this place and I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go uh, to a place you guys cannot come from. And Peter's like, you ain't going without me, Jack. He said, Satan, get behind me. Mm. I'm betting that one hurt a little bit. When he said, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, and Peter said, there's no way I will go to death with you. And then he heard the rooster crow after he denied him the third time. I bet that took off an edge. I bet that hurt a little bit. I bet that lasted with him. You see, Peter knew what it was, what it was like to be on the outside looking in. Peter knew uh, that um, he knew what it was like to, to not be good enough. Peter knew um, what it was like to, to have a past he wasn't proud of and for people to know about it. I bet, I bet we got a whole bunch of uh, people like Peter running around here today. I know there's one standing on this stage. <laughs> because I know what it's like to be on the outside looking in. There are very few churches I have felt comfortable in. Still today when I go visit other churches... I'm the preacher, and I don't like visiting other churches or hanging out with Christian people. It's odd. It's odd. The most uncomfortable I am is you put me in with, like, people who have been Christians all their life, and this preacher, like, doesn't like to be there. I tell people, like, Christians get on my nerves. They're like, what? I'm like, maybe I shouldn't say it like that. I, I don't know. I, I shouldn't say it like that. Maybe there's a better way to say that. Um, but I, I'm really uncomfortable because um, I remember what it was like. I I have things in my past that I'm not proud of. I'm guessing I'm not the only person here who's got a skeleton in their closet that they don't want to get out. <laughs> Peter knew what that was like, too. Here's something I know about everybody in this room. We're all struggling with some sin in our lives. 
You ain't sharing it with some people. Maybe some of you have got bold and you started sharing with people and asking for accountability. But all of us are still struggling with something. And Peter, he was still struggling. Yet Jesus takes this, this guy who had just denied him, this guy that, that Jesus had called Satan, this loser in every aspect, and in front of all of the rest of the guys who, who didn't mess up like Peter did, John, the disciple that Jesus loved, was standing at the foot of the cross, it says, with uh, Jesus' mother. So John is there, and James are there, and, and, and all of these other apostles are there, but it's just him and Peter right now. And he asked him three times, do you love me, Peter? And Peter is still messing it up. Do you love me sacrificially? I love you like a friend. Do you love me sacrificially? I love you like a friend. And Jesus is like, all right, let's start where he is. Do you love me like a friend? Peter's like, you know that I do. Jesus' command for Peter, Jesus' command for any of you who say that you are following Jesus is to feed my sheep, to take care of my lambs. That is your job. That is not my job. Not my job alone. I am one of the shepherds of this flock. I am not the only shepherd of this flock. And there should be within this flock other flocks. Because if you are, you are a husband, you are a man, you are in charge of your own family. I am not in charge of your family. It's not my job to teach them scripture. It's not my job to make sure they're following Jesus. It's my job to make sure you've got the tools to teach them scripture and help them follow Jesus. I know that, that Jesus gave us all a command to feed my sheep, to take care of my lambs. If you are not leading people to Jesus, if you are not teaching people about Jesus, if you are not serving the people of Jesus, then you are not following Jesus. And for some of you, I'm jumping all on your toes today because you don't like what I have to say, because you know you are not following Jesus. You are following yourself. And here's the thing. Peter was doing the same thing. And Jesus met him where he was and took him to where he needed to be. And Jesus wants to do the same thing with you. So here's the deal. Some of you need to know what your next steps are. Maybe this is the first time you've been to church. This is the third time you've been to church. You grew up in church all of your life. What are your next steps? I want to be this follower of Jesus. What the heck am I supposed to do next? For some of you today, you've been reading the scripture or you've been talking to, to some people here at church or somewhere else, and you realize that they keep talking about baptism in, in the Bible. And I, don't, I think I need to be baptized let me put your mind at ease. Jesus commanded all of us to be baptized. You don't have to think about it anymore. You need to be baptized. Now, when you're baptized, that's between you and Jesus and however that works, but you don't get a choice in this matter, period. So for you today, and, and, and here I want, you to, I want you to pull out those connection cards, those green cards. If you are here today and you say, you know what? I haven't been baptized yet. I need to be baptized. You can write on the back of your card that you'd like to talk to me about baptism. Or, or, at 1230 today, I'm baptizing anywhere from three to five people. Step up. Step up. You can get baptized in Bozier Rain right now. They've been in the water before. They'll be fine. You know, you'll make it home. You know, you're going to be all right. So, if you decide that, you know what, God's getting on my heart about this right now, step up. You don't even have to write it on the back of your card. You can just come talk to me afterwards, and we'll make it happen today. Some of you say, okay, i got to figure this out. Write it on the back of your card. I'd love to come talk to you about that. Some of you here have been following Jesus, but you have not been a good shepherd because you have not found a place to serve, to lead and protect his sheep. For you today... If you are not serving somewhere, write on the back of your green card, 
love to find a place to serve. Tell us what you'd like to do, and we will find a place that you can serve like that here or outside of here. You need to be serving. You need to be taking care of my lambs, period. If you are not doing that, you are following yourself. Oh, yeah. So this is going to be one of those times where we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way because God is going to keep chiseling down on you until you get to the place to where you're doing what is healthiest for you in the kingdom. I don't even got to do anything. I just get to stand up here and watch. <laughs> it's fun for me. So for those of you who are missing, you're saying, I, I'm not serving. I haven't been baptized. I, whatever it might be, write that on the back of your connection card. When we ask you to drop those in later on, drop it in. For some of you right now, Jesus is saying, it's time for you to get baptized. And we're going to go to a place where they actually have warm water. And here's the deal. you got to do your job. Your job is to get wet. It's not a real hard job. Like, we've all done this before. And, and, and I'm going to be the one, unless you choose somebody else, I'm going to be the one who puts you under the water and gets you back up. And it's going to be fairly easy, unless you're really big. And I might have to work out a little bit, but I'll lift, I'll lift with my legs, not with my back. You know, and we'll, we'll get you back up. It'll be fine. But the heavy lifting is done by God. He does all the changing. He does all the convicting. He does all the forgiving. We're just getting dunked in some water. So for some of you, that's the step that you need to take. And God will continue to chisel at you until you start to take those steps. I'm going to pray, and, and Tyler's going to come up, and he's going to play a little music as we go into communion time. But don't leave here without making a decision. Whether today is your day, to get baptized, or another time, or to start serving somewhere, whatever it might be, Jesus commanded you and me to take care of my lambs and to feed my sheep. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. I ask you, Lord, to give grace where these people need grace. I ask you, Lord, to whip their tails where their tails need to be whipped. I ask you, Lord, to love them like a father, as you always have, and make that clear to them. Remind them that you do the heavy lifting, and you do so much of this work if we just let you. Make yourself known today in this time of communion, in this time of worship, in the baptisms that are going to happen afterwards, and move us forward to be the shepherds that you want us to be. It's your son's name I pray. Amen.